Hi everyone, it's Max from Tasting History, seeing as this is Tasting History, but today is a little bit different than my usual episode because I am joined by Michael Twitty, who is an amazing culinary historian who focuses on African and African-American foodways. And we just got finished actually filming a more traditional uh, episode, but I had so many questions for him and my audience had so many questions for him that I asked him to do this just Q&A and he agreed. Thanks for joining me, Michael. No problem. So let's start off with questions from the audience. Sure. One of the questions that I, I, I've heard this story before, the hush puppy story. I, this is, <laughs> and I knew that that would be the reaction. So this is an opportunity to, to tell people what the story is and then debunk this story. So a couple of years ago on Facebook, story emerged the hush puppy was a result of enslaved people having these corn fritters to distract dogs as they're running away from enslavement. That's not only uncomfortable, but that ain't the way it went down. Okay, first of all, nah. Um, there were a number of, of tricks to distract dogs when, was, when one was running away, Okay red pepper on the shoes or the feet because it would irritate the nose of the dogs. We know about that from um, interviews done by people who actually made that harrowing journey. Or, you know, um, washing one's clothes a certain way so the scent would not be as apparent. Mm. Or going through water was a big one, okay? But Hush Puppies won it. Um, the, the name Hush Puppy likely comes from I can see that coming from us, from an enslaved source, an African-American source. In the sense of things being named after the thing that they do is a very Afro-linguistic thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying nobody else does it. Don't get mm -mm, Don't start with me. I'm just saying that, for example, even Gullah Geechee, um, a mechanic's called a beat on iron. Morning's called day clean. There are all these terms, right, for things that not, they're based on what that thing does. Or how it works, as opposed to corn fritter. Right. No, it's a hush puppy. That okay, that's part that part's cool. But as a means of like deflecting hound dogs, nah, I don't know who made that up. Who thought that was funny? It's not funny to me. It's weird. It's just weird. But again, that's that fake lore we have to debunk right. to get to the real meat of the truth of our history. It's interesting that you're talking about words that are Referring to what it does, my grandpa used to call gasoline push water because it was the water you put in the car to push it up the road. To push? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So maybe, maybe <laughs> something in there. That's deep. <laughs> so you, you mentioned a term there that somebody else had a question about and that I am actually curious about, and that is the Gullah communities. Mm -hmm. um, what are they? Where are they? And what makes them different from other African-American communities? That's great. So the Gullah Geechee Corridor goes from approximately Wilmington, North Carolina, south of Jacksonville, Florida, with the heart of it being on the coastal facing counties of Georgia and South Carolina. Now, one quarter of all enslaved people brought to the United States came through the Port of Charleston alone. One of every four African-Americans has an ancestor who, for whom that was their version of a uh, inverted Ellis Island. Those people who stayed on those islands and stayed on those coastal facing counties are the heart of the Gullah Geechee people. And there was a patois language unto its own um, that developed from the multitude of languages that were spoken by the people. Lots of Congo, some Yoruba, um, lots of Mende and Timne and Wolof, people who were growing rice, cotton and indigo, people who were cattlemen, blacksmiths, women who were cooks and basket makers. They would be in that land from the 1600s onward, would create their own unique culture. But here's the thing about them, though. <clears throat> I realize that people hear the, the language and they say, oh, that was only uniquely developed there. The reality is all African-Americans spoke a version of this patois that became eventually African-American vernacular English. Mm. But because the Gullah Geechee people, once they were established in these plantations, especially on the Barrier Islands, 
they rarely left. They were left alone for the right. most part. So they were able to keep parts of our culture that got diluted in other parts of the American South. But also, it was unique because they had they came from these fairly uh, cohesive groups of enslaved Africans. So my ancestors were Gullah Geechee. Um, those that, that did leave or were forced to leave their um, homeland by being sold out or being willed to other people carried aspects of the culture like rice growing and some of the language with them. So there's a lot of people, like for example, Oprah Winfrey has Gullah Geechee roots. Hmm. Um, Michelle Obama, Gullah Geechee roots. And there are descendants and there are people who are just straight up Geechee to the bone, like my good friend B.J. Dennis, who's a chef there, and many others who are really part of the culture and who are, in, who are increasing that culture by teaching it to future generations. So it's a very proud heritage, very unique heritage. And of course, like it's bound by, number one, above all else, the cultivation and eating of rice. That binds us to our ancestors. Our ancestors were growing rice in West Africa 5,000 years ago. If nothing else defines us, yes, go a Gucci person like, you know, have you had rice today? That's how you say, have you eaten? So it's a big part of the culture at large. Yeah. So now you mentioned rice coming over from West Africa. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier about the idea of the enslaved people bringing certain, certain seeds over and why that idea is maybe not exactly as, mm -hmm. as simple as it sounds. So here's the deal. Enslaved people, for the most part, did not freely walk around a slave ship. Some women did cooking on those ships. Some children, small children, were allowed to wander a bit if they were trusted. But for the most part, unfortunately, my ancestors, and that's why I say my, I take it personally. This is their unique experience. And it's the experience of millions of other Africans in the New World. And I guess one of the parts of my work that made me shudder the most was realizing that this wasn't a one-shot deal. This was, you know, there are parts of me in Brazil. There are parts of me in Jamaica. There's parts of me in Belize and in Mexico. So people who are related to me became Garifuna. They became, you know, people from Recife and, and Bahia. They became people from Veracruz. They became people from Port-au-Prince. Like... Families weren't just, it wasn't just one shot. It was, a family could be split up on the coast of Ghana right. and sent to four or five different places. So I'd say, say my answers is my people. And I do that deliberately because I want to take responsibility for the fact that this is, this is my people. So having said that, they did not come with culinary baggage or luggage other than what was in their head, in their heart, and their belly, right? And a lot of the times, they, what they would do in the slave ships was they would cater to the very base part of the diet. It's like saying, oh, I know you Northern Europeans love your bread, so we're going to give you some bread. Right. So if you're from Senegal down to Sierra Leone, Liberia, they gave you rice. Yams from there until Cameroon. And then cassava in Central Africa. And these foods would also make it across the ocean. So, for example, people think bananas and plantains are native to the New World. No, mm. they came through Africa through the slave trade from, of course, Eastern Africa, um, the Indian Ocean trade with, with uh, India and, and Southeast Asia. There's more diversity of those plants in Africa than in, in Asia where they started, which shows you that they were actively being used for various foodstuffs. And then when the Spanish and Portuguese came to the, the Americas, they brought them with them because they were also an essential food of West Central African people. So it was more like there was an idea. Now, we also have to think, take into consideration that there were pirates, there were missionaries, there were free people of color working on these ships. There were all sorts of individuals that could have brought a seed or a plant as a curiosity right. or as an as experiment, whatever. There were also people who were collecting plants and science and botanists and we don't, we're never going to know all the different ways these plants got to the Americas. But we know for certain they were not brought in people's hair. They might even come in, in terms of power objects worn in the body, you know, which often contain seeds or parts of plants. Um, some of them drifted across the ocean without human intervention. 
some of them or came or might have thrown, fallen off a ship and got to an island. And others were deliberately brought because the expectation was the Africans will grow these for themselves. And we won't have to feed them as much. Right. So there's a whole different way of looking at this history. We have to acknowledge that we will never know all the answers. But we have a general picture of what's going on. It will enable us better to tell the story. Right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned yams. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked about a dish that I, I did not know. Uh, is it fufu? Yes. How, how is that made? Where is it made? And was the American equivalent of sweet potatoes ever used in a similar, in a similar way, or do we know? So, yes, we do know that in the Caribbean in particular. Um, for example, mofongo. All those dishes that require, you know, plant, mash, plantain, mash, yam. In the Caribbean, in Haiti, in Brazil. Yeah. Why not America as much? Well, they did use sweet potatoes as a substitution for yams in some places. But they were often, remember, sweet potatoes back in the colonial period, early antebellum period, were often white or yellow skinned or red skinned with a white flesh. They were starchier. They were not quite as... Um, beta carotene colored and sweet and de nutrient dense. Um, they, were, they weren't really a good substitute, but they were what they had. Right. Okay, that's that. Yams are a whole different species. And they can be kind of bulky and, and hairy, and you scrape the, the skin off them, and then you use this, the white flesh. You boil it to death, and you pound it in a mortar and pestle. Okay, so when I went to Africa, I thought... I was going to be the fufu champion. I thought, this is part of my blackness. I'm going to go and I'm going to be the blackest black man ever, blacked and blacked. I'm going to eat my fufu and I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be an African man. I couldn't stand it. <laughs> First of all, it's just, it's just, it's, it becomes gl a glutinous mass. Mm -hmm. It's very gluey. It's not like mashed potatoes. It is this gluey mass and you put more water into it and you keep pounding it and you keep like airing it out until it's like this, I don't know how to describe it. It looks like kind of like, um, pardon my saying this, it looks kind of like a, um, a prosthetic part of the body. And then you have this, these mounds of this thing, and then you're supposed to like use your fingers, and it's almost always like steaming hot, and go like this, and dip your hand in this hot stew, and, and it's already 90 degrees outside. A complete African, even the equatorial sun, and they want you to eat this stuff with this hot stew, it was boiling hot, with these tons of hot peppers in it, and then you have to stick your hand in this hot, gluey stuff that feels like it's burning your fingers. Uh, West Africans, I love you. You're my people and my family, but I got to be real with you. <laughs> that was not... Mm -mm. This one woman just grabbed my bowl from you. She's like, you know what? Cut the nonsense. <laughs> I, this is good food you're wasting. Stop. So I love a mutua, which is in Ghana, which is, I don't like rice mashed potatoes, and it's a taste. Okay. I love the powdered yam, yam. Iyan and fufu are two different things. Because fufu can be made from yams, plantain, or cassava. But iyan is just, it's kind of like, kind of like a, a stiffer version of mashed potatoes. Okay. And it, so, you, so you feel, it feels That's more good. familiar. Yeah. And you can kind of dress up, see how you want. But fufu, mm -mm. The fufu that it sounds like a more rubbery version of poi. That's exactly it. Yeah, which I'm not a huge fan of poi. Because <laughs> you can make it from cocoa yam too. Yeah. Which is taro. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, again, it's acquired taste. I mean, I know for some people, they're like, I'm more authentic African food. And I ask you, do you? <laughs> because here's the deal. When I learned to cook African food from American and British cookbooks, they were always, they were just kind of like toned down to meet the cook where they were. Honestly, a lot of traditional African food involves a lot of palm oil. You got to be used to that. Palm yeah. oil is not an easy ingredient. Yeah. If you're not used to palm oil, it is thick, it, is, it goes through your system, it does some things to you. It's, it's just not the same. And then the fact that West Africa is a lot of hot peppers. So already we got the palm oil, we got the hot peppers. Another thing is, you know, though some of us are really picky. West Africa means the head, the tongue, the gut, everything. the intestines, the feet. The ham, the chine, the everything in the pot. Mm -hmm. The bones thinking about you. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings or dissuade them. But it's not 
it's not as tidy as people think of as European cuisine. But West African food is also like chicken and ground nuts too, which is amazing. It's also the way they do seafood and grilled fish is absolutely amazing. It's a lot of different things. You have to kind of pick and choose your battles. Some people love, you know, having the, the gooey kind of like spicy sauces that are very deeply a part of West African food. Some people love the fact that there's no waste of the animal and everything's on your plate and in your bowl. Um, some people love the fact that a lot of West African food is based on smoked or what they call stinking fish. Hmm. It's dried fermented fish. And, it's, and all, sometimes the smoked fish, which by the way, I saw that was made one day and I was like, okay, nah. <laughs> so the thing about it is, in the South, we had smoked meat. It was very European. Right. But in the European sense, smoked meat didn't go into everything, some things. But notice that in the South, it went into everything. That's the Africans going, this looks familiar. Right. Let me do what I did back home. Same thing happens in Brazil, in the Caribbean. Smoked fish and smoked meat flavor a lot of things. In West Africa, you go to the market and you see, and I've been to eight different African countries. Cameroon, Togo, Benin, Ghana, Sierra Leone. Senegal, Gambia, um, Nigeria. Wow. And so I've seen these markets over and over again. We have the stinking fish, which is like, it's like splayed open in the hot sun. It dr- kind of dries out. It also kind of putrefies. Yeah. Then they'll smoke the fish too over anything. I've seen people take printer boxes and caught, what are those things you put the pallets of the cars and burn yeah. those? And then there's the ones that's more a little more fish and whether you're in the bush. And you actually have natural wood you smoke the fish on. But I'm really trying to scare people. I'm just trying to say that there's a reason why you don't go out and rush to get, you know, <laughs> this food. It's just, it is an acquired taste. And, of course, there are some beautiful, gorgeous restaurants all over America. We can try authentic Ghanaian or Nigerian dishes or Sierra Leonean, Liberian dishes. But, again, know what you're getting yourself into. Be ready. And go with somebody who is from that culture, who can guide you through a menu so that you don't feel... I, there's no combo. There's no, like, <laughs> oh, the little number this, one, little please. this, little this, little this, and we good. No, it doesn't work that way. It, it really is a matter of um, engaging with the culture, understanding where the food ingredients come from, and why they match the people that make them. So you were talking about African cuisine and how a lot of it is an acquired taste. Um, what are some dishes that would be good for people to start off with? Number one is jollof rice. Jollof rice is basically the mother of red rice, the mother of jambalaya, Brazilian rice and Mexican rice. And in West Africa, it starts, you know, in the Wall of Kingdom, but then spreads. I call it the transnational dish of Africa because in West Central Africa, there are different versions of this red jollof. It's tomatoes, onions, other vegetables and aromatics in a pilaf, for lack of a better term. Okay. Okay. It's West Africa's answer to biryani, and it's, but it's probably as old, if not just as old, uh, or not older. So jollof rice is a big one. It's a good one. Um, I would also say, you know, chicken and ground nut stew or um, dorawat and any other chicken stews in, in Africa. They do it better than anybody else, I think. <laughs> I mean, they're just biased. But um, it's just the idea that you can take onions and turmeric and garlic and ginger and leafy greens and peanuts or other things, that peppers to make a sauce, and then ladle that over some rice and just... What's not to like? What's not to like? What's <laughs> yeah, not to like yeah. it, okay? That is very accessible. Another thing is akara. Akara mm-hmm. is black-eyed pea fritters, where you take the skins off and you mash the insides up. I don't know if you ice cream ball and we're using your hand, but right. throw them in that hot grease. It's, it's so good. It's so good. Um, there's so many examples like that, or like Chin Chin, these little, uh, in Nigeria, Cameroon, other British West Africa spots. It's like a, a little bit of, um, fried dough, sweet dough then beignet, of course, but I think African beignets are with banana or sweet potato or plantain or, um, you know, seasoned with sugar cane are the best. Some of the best you'll ever have, especially when you're in the market. When you're in the market and you're going, you're in Nigeria and they got that sweet potato, and they cut it up raw and it falls in that hot grease and they pull it out for you. Mm. And they sprinkle that cinnamon and hot pepper and, and 
a little salt, a little sugar on it. It's like a mixture of sweet and savory. Yeah. Oh my god, it's just the best. You know, there's a there's there's a real moment when you go there, someone like me, and you feel like you come home. You feel like you are you understand yourself a lot better. But anybody can go there. You know, it's funny because people say, "Well, I'm white, can I go to Africa?" So, of course, you're probably safer than I am <laughs> going there because everybody knows you stick out like a sore thumb. Everybody <laughs> knows who you are. But um. It was also a matter of hospitality. Some of the most hospitable people in the world. I mean, you've been to Morocco now, mm-hmm. but go to a Ghana, go to um, a Nigeria, go to Sierra Leone, go to Senegal. You're gonna find out. Hospitality. It is real. It is real, and it's deep, and it's it's good. Yeah. Now, studying African cuisine and the history of African mm-hmm. cuisine specifically, I I, I sometimes run up against. Uh, issues all over the the world of there is no written record, mm-hmm. so it becomes hard to to kind of push back the veil, especially when you have a lot of influence from Arabic cuisine mm-hmm. and European cuisine and everything. How do you tackle that with African cuisine? Because I feel like there is a lack of written record about mm-hmm. the food. So you have to tease things out. So there's archaeology. That's one piece. Western ways of knowing time and domestication and things through carbon dating or through remnants. There's also oral history. Oral and oral history. How we hear, how we speak it. There is also the commonly held history that that gives you hints, but not much more than that. Right. So the same thing dealing with the history of the foot of the enslaved. So I'll give you a quick example. Charles Ball wrote a book where he pretty much looks back on the entirety of his life from his childhood in Maryland through his enslavement in the Carolinas and Georgia, his several attempts to run away and his successful attempt, his search for his wife and children. He talks about food a lot. And so he talks about how he made a dish of a stewed pork and sweet potatoes with a woman he befriended named Lydia and her African husband and their extended family in this plantation in South Carolina. So the question he talks about an herb, he says, he says things like herbs, the pork, because they, they had to slaughter one of the hogs that was injured or superannuated or ill. And then he talks about sweet potato. So my first question is, what kind of sweet potato? Okay. So there was a type of sweet potato that was very popular called, excuse me, a Negro choker. And you often come against these terms like this. You need to steal yourself, because mm-hmm. they're coming. And it's the sense of someone being so gluttonous with the sweet potato, they would just eat it like, ah, right? So what was that like? And it said it was red-skinned with white flesh. Again, very yam-like, mm-hmm. as yam-like as possible, and dry-fleshed, Right. So then he talks about pork. What kind of pork? Well, it could have been a number of different wild hogs that was running around or semi-domesticated hogs. We also know there was a hog called a guinea hog that was brought through the Portuguese from Africa to the Canaries and Cape Verde to the American South. Uh, We also have the kind of um, ossobal hog, that's it, and many others. So if someone wants to recreate that, I'm like, okay, let's talk about the ossobal hog or the guinea hog. Let's talk about these specific types of sweet potatoes. We can do the white haman with the yellowish or white skin and the white flesh. Okay, herbs, what herbs? Well, we know that they had rosemary, sage, uh, um, parsley, thyme, other things, basil, right? That might have gone into the pot. He talks about pepper. What pepper? Was it black pepper? Was it kitchen pepper? Or was it red pepper? Unless they're very specific, yeah. it could have been any one of those. It's always so hard. <laughs> so by the time you, so you know there's, he also talks about onions. So that by the time you get, you've got a kind of sort of the form of recipe, okay? Also, we look at um, the, the records left by ensla- sorry, former enslavers who, were will- who had wills or had probate records. So even in the, co- the cooking gene, one thing I talk about was that with one of my ancestors, um, slaveholder William Bellamy, has a very specific probate record. And I don't come from his enslavement. I come from his, come from one of his sons, the grandsons. 
And it talks about how he had steak plates and a waffle iron in 1840. A waffle iron. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. He has a cotton and tobacco plantation in East North Carolina. He, has, he buys rice from Negro Luke for the sum of. Rice and onions from Negro Luke. Which is a pattern we see even in Thomas Jefferson Manicello of white slaveholders buying produce from the enslaved. Interesting. Um, which is very frequent. Or they might barter for other objects. And then, of course, it's like, oh, he had this many chickens, this many um, um, pigs, this many goats, this much property, this much corn in storage, this much milk had been gathered. So I was able to put together almost like a meal, a menu from this, you know, this probate record. There was bacon and there was whatever there was. Right, there were peas. What kind of peas were they? Most likely they were field peas, not the green right. peas that would have been eaten fresh. Right, they didn't store as well. <clears throat> so just knowing all that stuff helps you kind of piece together things. Or when you're reading, you know, some of the some of the the conversations between these European um, slavers or explorers or pirates or whatever, then I go to the elders, and I, I'll be in you know Gambia or something. I go, okay. That's what they said. What does this sound like to you? Oh, he's talking about that dish. This is what we make on this time. But pe the people who are reading this often forget about seasonality, trade. Not everybody lived near a body of water with viable fish resources. Right. So they had to get them from somewhere else. Or, you know, words or terminology that refer to specific seasons or, or areas of um, the countryside known for certain food ways. It's no different than Europe in terroir. Right. No different. But when you talk to the elders and people who are into the culture about those old references and, and art, archival pieces, they can give you an incredible body of knowledge because they're, they're hearing this and going, oh, he's probably talking about this. So, for example, one, one thing they got from one of the um, Huguenot um, writers was taught, they were talking about... Um, Greens, leafy greens. And he says that the Africans love the cabbage soup of the Europeans, but they make it their own way and they make it really hot, spicy, and, you know, beware. Well, he says cabbage soup. Well, what is like cabbage? Collard greens. Right. Which are also being grown on the coast of Ghana. It's always the coast because the coast was much more breezy, cooler. Collard greens don't grow well in hot, hot, hot weather. They grow well in cool weather which is one of another thing people forget about. But then once I was to put those pieces together, I was like, oh, that hot bottle of hot sauce and that thing, of mess of collards on my grandmother's plate made so much sense growing up. Like, again, you always get pulled back to things you remember. Right. Then you have to rely on your own sort of, like, sensibilities and memories. I met a girl, a um, young, young lady in, in the D.C. area. It was been 13, 14. And she says, oh, my grandfather in North Carolina... And he says, when you eat the peas half done, it makes you feel uh, uh, more full. I had never heard it, so I kept it locked away in my head. Then I'm reading a passage from um, Carl Lamont, who was a missionary in the Congo. And writes this huge treatise on the Congo people. And I turn the page, and there it goes. The old people among the Congo half cook their beans and peas as to, to, milk, to feel more full. Interesting. That kid just told me something that only kids kind of pay attention to. Yeah. That is that, you know, I, by the time I lost contact with them, but it was just like, wow, I know exactly where that piece of their family story comes from. Generations. Generations. Generations down. And it's so impressive because it's just like, oh my God, who would have thought? But then when you learn that piece, you're like, okay, I'll write it down. The next one comes, the next one, the next one. And this goes on forever. It's just like, I feel like a real calling and purpose to what I do. Because, you know, I, you know in our tradition, a person has to be able to call back on seven generations of ancestors. That's very difficult. But now that we have DNA research, now that we have yeah. so many other pieces to, the, to our toolkit, it's so much easier to have that relationship with the people from whom you come. So uh, we have time for a couple more questions. This one is totally out of left field, but so many people 
have asked about your time with Townsend. Yeah. So this is this is how I first was introduced to you was when you cooked. You did two or three episodes, right? Yep. If you don't watch Townsend's, you should watch Townsend's. I'm sure you do. Uh, I was inspired to do this channel by Townsend's. Um, so what was it like getting to work with John and, and his team? They were so great. Um, we got permission to film at George Mason's plantation, mm. Gunson, Gunson Hall. And we got there. I was a little late. They were a little late. And we got there a little afternoon, and we still banged out four videos wow. on the verge of sunset. We got it done. With one person behind the camera, another person interviewing with me. They were really great. I mean, I've, it's, it was fast. It, went, it felt like it was fast. It felt like it took no time at all. And we had a great time, and um, they really put me at ease. And they also let me have my own voice, right? which I really appreciate. You know, this is not easy work, especially when you're interpreting the history of enslaved people. Um, there are people who just don't forgive me for wearing the clothes, even though I'm no different than any of my white counterparts who work at Colonial Williamsburg or other historic sites. I'm just happy black. I'm not trying to embarrass or humiliate anybody. I'm also not trying to, to be, I'm not a reenactor. I am a, an interpreter. I'm a 21st century educated person who was giving you the lowdown of what happened in the past. Because it's important. Um, but they really let me feel, you know, at ease. And I could tell that I was working with people who were consummate professionals. So that was a really awesome experience working with Townsend. If you haven't watched those videos, they're worth watching. They're, they're, they're really great. They, I know it was a few years ago, but they are, like, fresh. They're really, really wonderful. Yep. Um, so a lot of people have asked... They ask me, and I have no idea what to tell them, but I know you do have an answer to this question. How do you become a food historian? <laughs> if I want to become a food historian, how do I do it? You read a lot, you cook a lot, you eat a lot. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> you also pay attention to people who do their work. Um, there's a lot of people. You should don't want to put out a good book. You just put out a great book. We have so many people out here who are doing the work of looking at food traditions from many link, many angles mm -hmm. and many lenses. Also, I, I would to encourage people to actually go in on the culture they come from because we have so many micro-histories that we don't have access to. Yeah. And it's because it takes someone who has both an outsider and insider perspective. Um, there are conferences to present that. I think an academic, uh, even if you're an independent scholar, having an, an academic part of your path is so important because... We want people to do this work seriously and have it be taken seriously. Yeah. This isn't just a hobby or a pastime. This is actually like gathering significant information to the story of the human race. It's not just about um, can I, you know, make something in the past that tastes good because we both know a lot of stuff from the past did not taste good. There's a reason why it's part of history. This is an acquired taste. It's like the foo foo. <laughs> right. Uh, foo -foo. Although my West Africans would be like, my brother, you didn't have the right foo foo. So you don't, don't, don't tell the Albroni, don't tell the Oyimbo this. No, you didn't have the right one. Mm. Come to my father's house. Um, but the other part of the reality is that, you know, some things have not been able to withstand industrialization. Some things tasted good for a minute, but not for a week. Mm -hmm. Some things tasted good because you were hungry. Mm -hmm. Some things tasted good because you really had nothing else, or you had too much of one thing. So, you know, it's like so I think that incredible line recorded by um, Olmstead, same Olmstead that did Central Park. He's walking, he's, he's in Richmond, Virginia, and he says to this older black man, he's a pejorative term, slightly pejorative term, uncle, he says, Uncle, what are you catching there, Shad? And he says, Oh, no, Massa. I wouldn't serve Shad to a whore's dog. <laughs> well, he, that's a deep way of saying it, isn't it? So what he's saying is, I'm not catching fishes to eat fish. I like certain things. I don't like certain things. Yeah. And I don't mess with Shad. Shad don't like me. I don't like Shad. That's all there is to it. But we have this unfortunate belief that everybody in the past who was poor, or oppressed, or marginalized, just ate anything that was around because they had to. That's a really unfortunate fake lore to tell our kids. Yeah. Everybody's always had preferences. And by the way, kids, everybody has always wanted to do things the easy way. This lie that women just love to do things the hard way, you know, from scratch all the time, or else they were insufficient is a misogynist lie. Yeah. It's, like, it's like the Joel joke. It's like, oh, you know... 
Why did grandma always cut the meat roast before she put it in the pan? I don't know. It made it taste better. Talk to grandma. Grandma says, the pan, the pan it didn't fit the pan. Yeah. So I cut it. Sometimes that's the simplest explanation and that's the reason necessity. why things are. Yeah. Necessity. But just, you know, I'd say jump into this. We need more. We don't have enough people doing this work. Agreed. And it's not going to take away from either of us because no. we may not have a, a niche area or, or, or yeah. the way people look at food history in general from a vantage point of multiple groups, it's, it matters. These are all human stories that need to have the light of day. Well, and like you were saying, it's important to bring your own voice to it, your own perspective. Absolutely. That's why it won't take away from us if more people are doing this because their perspective is different. We don't cover the same things. And even if we did cover the same things, we would cover them in very different ways because right. we come from different worlds, different perspectives. And the same thing with being a cook. Yep. Absolutely. Nobody's going to cook the same way. Yep. It's always your walk presence and my walk presence are not going to be the same. Yeah. And that's okay. Yep. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for the, the other video that we filmed hey. today. I can't wait for you to see it. Um, but I appreciate you sharing your knowledge, your time, giving up your entire day to be here with me. I, I'm, in I'm in love with California right now. I'm enjoying my winter break, Good. extended winter break in California, and it's a great pleasure to finally be around somebody as crazy as me and obsessive and has been all the same books <laughs> all the and same all books. the same stuff. And it's like, it's true. wow, how do you do it. that? So thank awesome. you, Max. Thank you, Michael. See you later. Bye-bye.